Ladies and gentlemen, a clearly erudite and thorough submission presentation by Mr. Kofi Abuchi. Please let's put our hands together for him once again. <laughs> I would like to move on quickly, and our next paper will be presented by Mr. Bright Simmons. Please let's put our hands together for Mr. Bright Simmons. <laughs> Good afternoon. When I first received this invitation, I definitely wondered why they had extended it to me. I mean, I saw a long list of some of the most distinguished legal thinkers in this country, um, academics, scholars, and I'm just a lowly technologist, though I've also dabbled in civil activism. So perhaps they were interested in the view of the consumer of elite production, which we've seen um, since morning. What are our elites in academia, in politics, um, and in other spheres of national life produce must be consumed? Except that some of us are not comfortable just being consumers. We become contesters. So we become what some refer to as either civil activists uh, or social activists. Now the question, as somebody rightly pointed out in the very beginning, is when we theorize a construct such as civil society, we give it you know, such an amazing name. Uh, what are the values that drive civil society? Initially, my thought was I would just come in and give you an idea of how unelected uh, people in this country arrogate to themselves the right to speak for the public, of which I'm sure Imani um, or some of the other uh, prominent activist organizations, some of them being research institutes, um, as well as those that are not research institutes, um, contribute to national development. Some of you have wondered, on what basis do they make these pronouncements on behalf of the public? Then I thought, why not actually try and decipher the very foundations of this public interest or national interest that everybody else claims they are projecting? Because Imani will claim they are speaking um, to public interest or on behalf of public interest. Politicians claim that they are serving the public interest. Maybe we've taken it too uncritically. Then I thought that was itself not sufficiently elucidating. Maybe rather than that, I should do what perhaps the organizers really had in mind when they invited me, which is come in and provoke some of the more distinguished speakers into, uh, if I can, tantrums, by making some fairly perverse arguments. And perverse if you are the kind who followed public affairs for a long time, not only in Ghana but elsewhere, then you definitely will find my conclusions perverse. I'm going to make an argument that public interest is not the same as national interest. And I'm also going to make the argument that this is not a distinction without a difference. That it's not just hair splitting. That it's fundamental to the challenges we face in this country in coming to a rational consensus about what is important. I will start that by looking at the works of Hans Morgento. Those of you that are sociologists or political science aficionados probably have come across him. And some have called him the father of realism. And like somebody like myself who began my introduction or my familiarity with public affairs through the real politics school, this notion that you can have all the ideals you want. You can have, a, some call it a utopian worldview. Uh, but reality is reality. And political economy must be realist because in the end, our perspectives of what is good and noble rarely coincide. So if you are a realist like myself, and yet still your heart is liberal interventionist, you are, you know, classical liberal or even nowadays what, what they call um, liberal in America, if you are that kind, you still wonder whether the structures of the existing society are in alignment with the aspiration that you have for that society. And often they are not. So regardless of, you know, whether your heart is for a liberal worldview or not, there are structural conditions on the ground which determine how society should be run. Now, people like Hans Mogento have always defined national interest from the point of view of competition among powers. And by powers, they mean political entities often of a fairly contiguous form. So you can think of them as countries, you can think of them as empires or kingdoms. But as far as realists can perceive, the world of politics is mostly Certainly since the 17th century, a matter of defining your national interest in contradiction or in perspective of what other powers might do or believe. 
So if you take that definition of national interest as paramount, which is that you cannot define Ghana's national interest unless you understand what are the other powers that are within the neighborhood that Ghana oppress within, and what do they do? When we had colonial struggle, it was a bit easier, because then we had a national elite, and then you had a colonial elite, as you use this. We had a national elite, and then a colonial elite. And you could say that our interest in mobilizing for independence was a contest between the British elites who had imposed a colonial order on us and a national elite that was seeking to overthrow that particular order. Now, when you become independent, obviously you need to look at how other countries, other systems, powerful corporations are behaving and how you define your interest in competition with those powers. If we take that as a very good um, definition of national interest, then I dare say we are close to perhaps appreciating a slight distinction between national interest and public interest. I will not say categorically, taking a cue from my good friend, that public interest is always about domestic priorities and that national interest prioritizes more competition among nations. What I will say though is that when you consider national interest, you are looking at the history of how some of the countries and systems and empires and kingdoms that have had a longer period to come up with clear definitions about, this matter, about these matters have evolved. And I'll come to some of those explanations as I go on. Now, one easy way of looking at this is to take the debate that we often have in Ghana about loyalty to the party or is it loyalty to the government. So if you're a civil servant, you are bound by your oath to be loyal to the government. If you are a political party operative, some will say you are bound by particular types of fidelities to be loyal to your political party. Then some argue that because of these sectional loyalties, national loyalty often gets diluted. Now, if we consider, for instance, that governments purport to act in the public interest, and yet still we often feel that we need civil society to contend with government, then immediately becomes obvious that for the vast majority of people, are taking for, for granted that there is support for these civil society organizations, then we can take for granted that the, the perception of public interest often is not what the government of the day believe. And I'm not talking only of the political parties and the politicians, I'm also talking of the civil servants. I remember in my days when I was more active in the media, um, taking on national policies, which had often been given the green light by bureaucrats in the civil service. And some of them, when I interacted with them, I could feel a genuine sense of frustration. You know, we are here, we have a long-term vision. We're not just doing the will of the political parties. And then you pop up from nowhere, no clear pedigree, and you are asking us why we think we need a loan from South Korea of $10 billion to build 200,000 houses, most of them for the security services. We are doing it because of national interest. Then you argue, you know, that's not really national interest, or rather, it's your perverse interpretation of national interest, but I'm standing firmly on public interest. And public interest means that we need to scrutinize this particular policy for value for money. And they go, no, security at this stage is a priority set by the national government, which is led by elected representatives. And we have the mandate to set national interest. Yet still, from a participatory grassroots approach, you do see that people constantly feel as if those who have, given, who have been given the mandate do have the authority, the constitutional authority and other types of authority, simply appear not to be acting in the public interest in the minds of other actors. My argument is that if it was so intuitive that national interest and public interest are identical, then the debate will not be that we think civil servants and the police and the rest are not necessarily looking out for public interest. The debate will be just purely about the definition of national interest. But often it goes beyond that. Sometimes to the point where we acknowledge the policy dynamics of the government. And then we argue that for particular considerations that to us are more strategic, they should think again. Think of the Ameri situation that happened recently, where government felt that because energy was so important, they needed to introduce emergency power. And that the emergency power required that perhaps a lot more be spent than would usually be the case. Several of us were adamantly in opposition. We were in opposition because we had in our views several publics some of whose interests clearly did not align with this. One of those publics was the consuming class, which knew that if you buy emergency power at such a high price, then the price of power will go up dramatically. 
Now, the government's argument is that the integrity of the state was critical, and given the fact that energy supply at that point was a national security problem, we needed to assert national interest. I feel very strongly that sometimes one of the challenges that we have, and I'll, I'll state two, in my view, overarching challenges that confront us when we try to determine what is in the public interest or national interest. One of which I think is often that we don't really look at where our institutions that we've built up had their, cut their teeth. We don't often go back into the European and American and other contexts, sometimes Asian contexts, where some of these institutions that we are trying to um, accommodate ourselves to where, how they've evolved over time. And how some of these contestations in those particular jurisdictions have shaped the logic, the way that these institutions behave, regardless of the people that write them. Now, when you look at, say, France, and you take the French Revolution, many people don't really appreciate that. Initially, it has nothing to do with the masses. What happened was that France had a deficit, very similar to the United States case when the country had to be shut down. France had a deficit. The country was spending at a rate that the, the, the royal estate simply could not afford to finance. Now, the king of France had not called what you might call a parliament. It's not really a parliament, but let's call it a parliament, an assembly. Uh, at that time, it was called the Estates General. He had not called the Estates General for more than 150 years. But he needed to raise money. And the money was going to come from the people who were elites, members of the elites, particularly the clergy, the aristocracy, but also those who represented common people in the towns. He needed them because he needed to foist taxes on the people to fund France's national deficit. Now, why was France in deficit? Some of the spending that had arisen had come because France had decided that it was in, in its national interest for the United States to break away from Great Britain. So they felt that the colonial presence of the United Kingdom in the United States or in the Americas was a threat to France's national interest. And therefore, they had considerably funded the rebellion led by George Washington. They had therefore led to a deficit. And now the king found out that the royal estates could simply not fund this deficit. He summoned the estates general. You had the clergy as the first estate, you had the nobility as the second estate, and then you had the common people as the third estate. And then he tried to impose this tax upon them. Then the estates general said no. Actually, we think the way we've been spending the money for the last, you know, 200 years. Now, we feel it's not in the public interest. I mean, whether or not decolonizing of the Americas and therefore clipping the wings of Great Britain was in the national interest, to me, may be debatable to some of you. I am perfectly of the view that it was definitely in France's national interest. The refusal of the Estates General to pay for it because it was not in the public interest, in my view, is a classic example of the tension that can exist between the two. Whether criticizing our governments to the extent of insulting people that are in high office, debases those offices, and therefore afflict the national interest, compared to the public interest of preserving freedom of speech, to me, it's a clear, 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 and justified distinction. Those of you who think it's hair splitting should begin to look at some of the examples where we've had different spheres and different departments of our national life contend with each other aggressively. And if you look carefully, sometimes you will see this contrast between national interest and public interest. And that brings me to the point of nationalism, which I think somewhere in the middle of the 17th century took a turn that has by and large not changed. The Peace of Osborne had not been enforced for many years, so the princes of Europe came together and called for further discussions in Innsbruck and other parts of Germany. Eventually, there was, the Treaty of Westphalia was, was, uh, was signed by very, about 300 German princes and several other European notables. Now, the fundamental principles of the Westphalian ethic define the nation state in a way that become, became bounded, in the sense that what happened in your territory was your business. In the past, princes had treated their estates as personal property. You know, I have dominion. So the, the king, one of the most important uh, kings of England, Richard III, often called the Lion Heart. He stayed in England maybe 15% of his time. Most of the time he had estates in France, particularly in Normandy, where he spent his time hunting, and he, he barely spoke English. That was, for, the, for many, many centuries, the order of reality in Europe. Princes had personal patrimonies across the continent which defined 
their power and their rights. And almost all legal disputes, like the investiture dispute, whether the king in your area should be the one that hands over the authority or the symbol of authority to the bishop, all of these were defined in terms of rights. Very rarely did this notion of the public exist. It was, in the first place, the strong emphasis on nation states that this treaty brought up, that people then began to feel that, okay, I am French. For many years, these uh, identities were highly fluid. Just as for many years, an Asante was an Asante and a Dagumba was a Dagumba. Now, when these ideas of nation states were formed, you could only heighten the distinction of being a Ghanaian or a Nigerian if you have certain views about all Ghanaians, which you think is in some form of competition with all Nigerians. But if you are like certain elites of today where you stay in Lagos but you holiday in Accra, perhaps it's not that clear. My argument is that without a concept of nation states that are competing against each other, it is very difficult to define the national interest. That is the core of my argument. The second core of my argument is that once you have that national interest, it becomes possible to derive a notion of nationalism where people feel proud that I'm Ghanaian, I'm German, etc. And the, the next core is that once you have that particular national interest and in the sense that you have to build national pride, you have to make Ghanaians feel Ghanaian, and therefore you are competing with Nollywood. So the Ghanaian president says, look, the Nigerians are now the world's largest producers of movies. When we were we, where were they? Road to Kukrantumi. I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to actively invest in making sure that Ghana overtakes Nigeria in the production of movies. I'm saying that that kind of thinking is classic national interest. Somebody might say, no, we are people without water in the village. It doesn't work. That may be public interest. But my argument is that before you can get to public interest, often it requires the setting up of mechanisms and processes we derive first from national interest. The ability of people to governize and say, we have water in Kukran, too many, it's your problem as the government to solve it, did not just emerge out of nowhere yesterday. It took a long period of historical evolution in Europe and elsewhere before people felt that because we are all Ghanaian, there's something called a national cake. So this notion of the national cake has not always existed. If you went to, the, the, let's say you were a, a Visigoth, or you lived in the Papal States in the 18th century, the notion that the government of Italy was responsible for your well-being is nonsense, patent nonsense. That emerges out of a nationalist inclination, that we are the particular community, and this particular community, even though people like Benedict, and, uh, Benedict Anderson would call it an imagined community. To give you an example, somebody in Dagomba 200 years ago owed allegiance to the Moro Naba in Burkina Faso. He had stronger ties to people in the Moshi Kingdom and shared more with the people in the Moshi Kingdom Way more than I can ever have with any guy. Today, we say somebody who is a Dagomba or a Mampusi has more links to an Asante than he has to a Moshi person. I will argue that this is a myth we've created, but it's a very powerful myth. It's the nationalist myth. And this myth and other such myths constitute the essence of nationality and nationalism. And it is when they have been deepened to the point where people feel proud of their nationality that they can begin to sense that, oh, actually, just because I'm Ghanaian, the Ghanaian state needs to take care of me. I'm arguing that never having done that, never having defined those with whom you are competing, never having defined those with whom you are in constant friction with, you are unable properly to build the processes and the mechanisms which ultimately will give you public interest. So I've done it a kind of 180 degrees turn. I've acknowledged that public interest sometimes that differs from national interest. And I've argued that for many of us, our heart is really with public interest nowadays because of humanism, liberalism, internationalism, globalization, cosmopolitanism, etc. Our heart really is with uh, the human dynamic. I want what time I village more than I want Ghana's movies to triumph over Nigerian movies. That's fine. But I'm arguing that the processes that will lead you to get there have to be built from somewhere. And everywhere else you will look, it started from national interest, competition among different nations. So when you look at China and when China acts today, 99% of the time, its Politburo members are sitting there looking at Japan, the United States, etc. They define themselves in contradiction with them. They define themselves in competition with them. And they define themselves in perpetual tension and friction with them. And this, it may be a myth. It may be that the average Politburo member saves more money in the Swiss uh, uh, banks and spends most of his time in London. It may be a myth that he genuinely thinks that China as a construct is more important than his personal relationships with the American president. The truth, though, is that even if that was what he felt, you need the myths 
that we are in competition with America and Japan, and therefore we need to have a strong military, etc. And I'm saying that through that process, then you begin also to think, if my people are not healthy, if they don't have water, if they don't have electricity, then they are unlikely to be able to compete with the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Japanese and the Americans, etc. So I'm saying the national mechanism for national interest is the underlying structure based on which you have the system for developing the public interest. Maybe all I've said is rubbish because it's Eurocentric nonsense. I've quoted uh, Hokaima at some point on my slides. You've seen Jürgen Habermas. Uh, you've seen Adorno. Uh, maybe at some point I was arguing from the perspective of Wilfredo uh, Pareto. You can sense that Eurocentricity in the, in the text. And some of you probably have switched off long ago. So I did this. I don't know how much time I have, but I tried to say that actually we've recognized this all along. It's just that we've created this ridiculous myth that we are 69 years old or we are 59 years old as a country, which is completely ridiculous. There are kingdoms in this country that are 600 years old. The Dagomba Kingdom, the Bunu Kingdom. There are kingdoms here that are at least 300 years old. And some of those are continuous realities in our exist current existing uh, reality. We have seen the recent um, hula balu over whether the Tepahine, uh, uh, sorry, the Asompahine representing the Asantehine should have stood up when the Ochehine arrived at the, at the Deba or not. So people are bemused. Don't be bemused. Barely 100 years ago, that was interstate diplomacy, interstate friction, national interest defined in various parts of Ghana. And I'll go on and show to you that one of the great ways of looking at this is to look at 1850 thereabouts, the middle of the 19th century, the great carry inflation. For those of you who are not aware, for many years, Africa had a fairly functioning international trading system and currency. So when you think of the eco and the rest of it, don't think this is some modern invention. We had carries that we used across the region. And there were kings and queens and the rest who had established the positions and the rest of them to ensure that this currency functioned. But somewhere around the 1850s, carries started to be imported because the British were losing ground in some parts of East Africa. And they started to import them in great quantities into West Africa. And we had a huge inflationary spiral across the sub-region. Funny enough, you don't detect a trace of this in Asante economic history. For some reason, the Asantis don't seem to have been affected by this policy. Though they had a huge functioning, what is often called the Batafiku, which is a system of trade that is managed at national level in Asante. And they use carries, but for some reason, they were not affected. My interest was in why. And digging further, I realized that around that same period that the inflation happened, you had a Pax Asante. By that, I mean that you'd had nearly 30 something years of peace across the Asante Empire. Of course, there were still a few wars here and there. And the funny thing enough was that what people don't realize is we did have political parties in the past. For most of Ashanti history, you had two parties that contended, the Peace Party and the War Party. The Peace Party was now in power in Ashanti, in Kumasi, led by Nana Kwekudua I. Funny enough, Nana Kwekudua I, as a young man, was in the War Party. He had led a lot of the conquest further north in Kuranza and the rest of it. Now, the interesting thing around this period of time was that he had begun to decipher that he could use strategic negotiations and the rest of it rather than war to continue to enjoy some of the largesse that they had at the height of the empire when Nana Osekwe Jo Okunwea, Nana Osekwe Tutu, Asibe Bonsu, and the rest had taken Ashanti to its largest territorial extent. He felt he didn't need to use war continuously. One of the things he did was to come into a strategic treaty with the Dutch to provide them with 1,000 soldiers to fight some of their wars in Indonesia and the rest of it. This was an Ashanti king, sitting there and making calculations, deciding that, look, I'm going to call the representative of the Dutch, and we are going to sign a treaty that I will deliver this to them if they do this to me. What did he want? He wanted guns from the Dutch in order to break British monopoly established through the Fante. So this was somebody thinking very strategically. Part of the reason why they could do that was a policy system around monetary management that, in my view, will make the Bank of Ghana of today square. The Asante operated three currencies, gold, dust, cola, and carries. And the principles behind creating a trial system where they did not allow one particular currency to cross a particular border, etc., was because at that point, their strategic neighborhood had been defined from a political economy of trade perspective. When you were a British administrator from the forts looking at Ghana, this is what you saw. Fairly clean divides of, you know, Peru is there, Asante is there, etc., etc. And you, as far as after 1974 in particular was concerned, your goal was to maintain some of these borders at all costs, including using imported Maxim guns. 
But if you are an Ashanti general and a member of, say, the war party in Kumase, looking beyond, this is what you saw. Not so clean. And your goal was to implement this tri-monetary system because you didn't want the Fanti to trade in the north. You didn't want the northerners, particularly the Gonje, that the Gumba to trade in the south. And you therefore spent cola in the north, and you spent gold dust in the south, and you spent carries within Ashanti. And you prevented the establishment of exchange rates that you did not control, to the point that when they begin to displace carries, during the calculation, using current rates, they were making margins on using of cola, exchange rate benefits that they were making, was in the region of 50% or more. So the Ashanti would sell cola at a rate that was appreciated enough that any losses they took on the carry side was offset by the gains, exchange rate gains they made on the cola side. Imagine that that kind of thinking requires you to be thinking that you are in competition with the Dagomba, the Gunja, etc., the Dutch, etc., etc. And that that is fundamental to the war party or the peace party in this case, strategic arrangement to use an exchange rate policy that prevented the Gunjas and the Dagombas from making enough on their colas and prevented guns from ever reaching the northern parts of this country for many, many years. By controlling the trade routes and by using the currency manipulation system that today people accuse China of using, Asante maintained a dominance without fighting a lot of wars for over 30 years. I think this kind of cross-frontier elitism, so if you are Opoku Frefre in Asante, if you are uh, Nasua in the north, or if you are uh, Kinokaiku in the south, and you thought across frontiers, and you thought of what other elites were thinking of and the rest of it, invariably must evolve into a situation where ultimately you can justify that within the committee of nations you are important. And I argue that in, in, in making the effort to induce pride in the people that you rule, you also lay the ground for potential rational consensus for elites within your own country. Let me make an example. When the United States says we have an unadorned, unabashed policy of supporting Israel, and you find a democratic leader actively, in fact, running over herself to confirm that policy, and you find a Republican trying to do so, you wonder what the hell is going on. They've defined something called national interest. It may well not be in the public interest of the U.S. because maybe it keeps prices of oil high, etc., etc. But my argument is that the reason why they're able to develop that rational consensus is because they create these myths of external enemies, myths of external realities, competitions that may not exist, frictions that may not exist. They induce these kind of tensions in order to develop that rational consensus among the elites. That's why I said at the beginning, it's going to be perverse, what I'm going to say. But it's the truth. There's no country in the world that has dramatically expanded in terms of its wealth and territory without thinking that they have enemies. And everything they have to do is to safeguard themselves against those enemies. Whether you think of Singapore, South Korea, etc., you will find existential enemies, enemies that they have created and conjured, and some of time, sometimes actually true enemies, who will wipe them out if they let lose their guard. If you can imagine any other country, even the Swiss, that have not developed according to this timeline, I'll be surprised. So my point is, we've been trying to do something similar to public interest for 50-something years without any grounding at all in national interest. When I look at the policies that the government makes, when I look at sometimes how the private sector thinks, when I look at the debate that goes on in the media, I am constantly embarrassed by the lack of awareness of any kind of international competition in Ghana. We don't seem to have any sense that we are competing with anybody at all. So whether you come and you think of standards, whatever, I'm sure Lawyer Bochi is always aware, you know, he practiced corporate law, and he's aware that he's competing with lawyers from elsewhere for some international deals and he's constantly aware of the new standards that are emerging in his discipline and his field. But I'm not sure that among most of his colleagues, that is the agency they have, and certainly not in government. And I know that because for almost a decade in this country, I was constantly, including with people like Mr. Bento who are here, trying to push government around some notion of national interest, often starting from a public interest. But because often national interest was not very clear and paramount, the rational consensus was often not there. So even from the point of view of civil society, you don't have the amalgamation of forces that you need to overthrow the system. And I argue that that's because we really never, have never had a true national interest. And never having evolved through the national interest, trying to impose public interest, as far as I can see, is building on no foundation. I have seen some of my friends, the very eminent lawyer, Ampa here, who is on the, the left side of the political spectrum, and he may argue that it's simplistic, 
and there are much more dynamic factors at play. But I was still content that notwithstanding the oversimplification of the point, the reality of the fact is that no country that has, not, no country that has defined its public interest without a history of national interest based on competition among powers has developed a presence on the globe that is significant. If you can mention one, maybe I'll retract my argument. So where does civil society fall into this? I think civil society is making do with what it's been given. In a context where you cannot have true rational consensus because the elites really don't know what to unite around, there isn't any notion of national values based on national survival, which means, therefore, that if I'm MPP and I'm for this matter, we don't joke with it. It's about Israel. I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, it's Israel. Or it's about um, America's strategic uh, um, assets in the Arctic. We don't joke about strategic assets in the Arctic. It doesn't matter whether you are PPP or what. The fact that we don't have those things, all of it has created a situation where it's almost impossible to agree on anything based on debate in Ghana. And that is a very sad conclusion I've had to draw. And part of the reason why I withdrew from some aspects of public debate in Ghana. Because if you cannot, through debate, define the national interest or define rational consensus, then ultimately, regardless of what happens, some unilateral decision will be made. And let me give you an example. CDB loan. What was the argument of um, some of those who were on the opposing side of the dominant mainstream thinking in, civil, uh, in the civil service and in the government? The argument was very simple. You cannot purport to establish some kind of national framework for infrastructure investment without having done that work and now trying to borrow for it. Now, the arguments that were rationalized could have led to a situation where there was deep mobilization even within the ranks of the ruling party to say, look, you've got to do your homework first. Eventually, we went into it before starting to do the homework. That meant that dynamics in China changed, and we didn't get the $3 billion. Or well, we got maybe a $1 billion, but it wasn't really through the $3 billion. That was another private company financing it. So the truth is, we never got a single cent of that money. Now, my argument is, how is it not possible that a country as sophisticated as Ghana, with the kind of eminent people we have here, cannot have a rational consensus around the notion simply that do your homework around infrastructure projects first, start to build uh, um, your, your blueprints and the rest of it, then borrow. I'm saying that it's almost impossible in any matter of national interest to have that kind of rational consensus. And civil society has simply jumped into that fray to spare some kind of competition which perhaps might create a semblance of a rational consensus. Now, my last point. Perhaps even civil society is deluded. Maybe what civil society should focus on doing is generating and inducing tension among the elite. So civil society, civil society should become increasingly partisan in order to drive partisan competition, which will create a race to the top because different political parties are actively competing for once. Today, we know what they do. They avoid competition by following on frivolous stuff. And so the lack of intra-elite competition built on top of the lack or the lack of history of inter-elite competition has created a situation where you can't have rational consensus. Some say then civil society will step in and create some unified theory of how this country should move forward. Then DPC has jump at the opportunity. My argument is that we are not there yet. First, we must fearfully and with trembling work out the national interest through competition among factions and interests. And perhaps civil society's strongest goal is that, which is we want to see more, not only money versus ISODEC, but we want to see a situation where civil society aligns with different political parties strategically and tactically. And that civil society also align create more competition, and out of that, the elite anguish will emerge. And perhaps through that, we will have national interest, which will ultimately lead to public interest. Thank you.